to stream other great series, log in to ABC iView. Tonight, essential food and supplies finally making it through the Stewart Highway heading north, but for many, the wait continues. We're still um, basically inaccessible from north, south, east and west. Also, what's behind another change to South Australia's COVID testing regime? The Queen's nod to Camilla as the monarch prepares to mark 70 years on the throne. And Brighton prefers bonds, the Adelaide fundraising tradition, back to scratch another itch. Swimming around the jetty, all for a great cause to raise money for cancer research, prevention and care. Good evening, Richard Davies with ABC News Sunday. Limited traffic is flowing along the flooded section of the Stewart Highway, restoring the main link between South Australia and the Northern Territory. Trucks are now able to traverse the stretch of road in the state's north under a police escort. But for some remote outback communities, the anxious wait for supplies continues. Australia's north rejoined with its south, one of the country's most crucial arteries getting back in action after more than a fortnight underwater. I've been pressuring the poor engineer that's been here. It's like every day, when are we opening, when are we opening? The first trucks passed this flooded stretch of the Stewart Highway with the police escort this morning. The manager of the Glendambo pub saying goodbye to a full house of stranded drivers. We had police, SES, railway workers... Road workers, I think that, yeah. yeah, it's only workers we've had in here in the last week. Even the most seasoned Outback residents have been shocked by the recent deluge. I've never seen rain like this. Um, I was brought up on stations all my life and uh, never seen it like this. This is a massive relief uh, to people who have been waiting on critical uh, items to come through. Uh, we've had dozens through already uh, this morning. Four-wheel drives should be able to use the road from Tuesday and all other traffic by the end of the week. While this key road has been partially reopened, it could be over a week until the railway line connecting Adelaide to Perth and Darwin is repaired. And many parts of outback South Australia still remain isolated due to flooded, unsealed roads. Some towns like Oodnadatta are cut off from all directions. In a normal week, six pallets of produce would be delivered to the Pink Road House, but now it's relying on the RFDS to fly in essential supplies. We're putting a two to three hundred kilo order in with them, and that'll get us out of out of the trouble out of trouble for a few days. These communities see a silver lining. The desert comes alive. The lake is filling, so it gives people an absolutely fantastic reason to visit the outback. It's been good to see that they're all starting to move again. Let's bring on the traffic. <laughs> traffic that's already started to flow. Georgia Roberts, ABC News, Glen Dambo. The state government has updated its advice to strongly urge anyone with COVID-19 symptoms to now get a PCR test. It's removing the exemption that allowed close contacts to use a rapid antigen test instead, as case numbers stabilise and queues at testing stations all but disappear. As cases fall, testing queues have shrunk, but the government wants people who feel sick to get back in their cars and get a test from a professional. Everyone with symptoms, uh, whether they uh, be a close contact or just somebody that develops uh, some symptoms, needs to have the PCR test, not the rat test. The convenience and growing availability of rapid antigen tests have seen them become many people's preferred way to check for COVID-19 but they have a high rate of false negatives, meaning many cases get missed. If you have any symptoms at any time, you should be getting a PCR test, not relying on a rat test because of this false negative rate. There were 1,234 new cases of COVID-19 and one death recorded in the last 24 hours, fewer than the day before. The reduction in cases is allowing the Premier to start his pre-election pitches, telling families the Liberals have lowered electricity prices since coming to government. Escoza, the independent umpire, now says that households on average are saving $421 per year. The opposition says the National Energy Market Commission has contradicted that claim, forecasting price rises for South Australia this year. 
the Labor leader was on Main South Road, promising a $125 million package to fully duplicate the vital route and build overtaking lanes further down the Flurio. So rather than having the Liberals' plan of going from two lanes to three, let's do it properly the first time and go straight to four lanes, which is exactly what Labor is provisioning for. The government says Labor's not consulted locals about the plan and is unlikely to be able to deliver it. Eric Torchek, ABC News, Adelaide. The Festival Plaza on the banks of the Torrens is designed to be the centrepiece of Adelaide's revamped Riverbank precinct. But with festival season looming, it's still not open and the state opposition is asking what's causing delays and cost blowouts to the project. Designed to revitalise the city's Riverbank precinct, the Festival Plaza will link the Festival Theatre, Parliament, Railway Station and the Casino. Late last year, the state government said a large part would be finished by January, but it remains closed. This was meant to be open for the public right now. This was meant to be something that South Australians could enjoy this festival season. The opposition says not only is the project delayed, the costs have again blown out. An extra $7.7 .7 million has been handed to the Festival Centre, which has been closed since July last year due to the works. It seems that taxpayers have once again got it in the neck because of poor commercial negotiations from Stephen Marshall. And we still haven't got the project we were promised uh, that should have been open more than a year ago. The Festival Plaza is the public part of a major commercial project. Developer Walker Corporation is building an office tower that has also been plagued with cost blowouts and delays. Late last year, the state government renegotiated a deal with the company that increased the size of the tower and pushed out the date for completion until at least 2024. But the government says while the tower is still years away, the plaza should be open soon despite the challenges of the pandemic. The crews that have been working on those projects have done a really incredible job to get themselves ahead of schedule to make sure that if there have been any setbacks through COVID or alike, they've been able to absorb those. In a statement, a government spokesperson says the eastern part of the plaza will be open this month, while a formal launch of major event spaces won't happen until March. It says over the March long weekend, a series of activities and events are planned for the plaza. Leah McLennan, ABC News, Adelaide. The Prime Minister says he's forgiven Barnaby Joyce for branding him a hypocrite and a liar in an explosive text message sent last year. It's the second damaging leak in the space of a week, but Scott Morrison is trying to move on from the drama, declaring politics is a brutal business. Here's political reporter Jane Norman. Delivering Sunday morning absolution. Human frailty, it's real. We all share it. The Prime Minister forgives his deputy for his sins. People get angry, people get bitter. So who am I to be judging someone else? And attempts to turn the other cheek in the face of another insider attack. What people send around in texts, I frankly could not care less about. In a leaked text message from March last year, Barnaby Joyce called Scott Morrison a hypocrite and a liar. Words he now says he regrets. I'd like to start by finish and unreservedly apologise to the Prime Minister. A backbencher at the time. And when he was in a pretty dark place blaming a lot of people. Mr Joyce claims he didn't know the real Scott Morrison until he became the Deputy Prime Minister. His observations of me and that relationship has completely transformed his view that he had as a backbencher at a time when his head was in a very different place. But the year old's character assessment is a gift to the opposition. Seems like the people who know Scott Morrison the best trust him the least. And with mere months until the federal election, Liberals are questioning whether the Prime Minister can turn that perception around. Is Scott Morrison the asset that he was three years ago for you in a campaign? The circumstances are very different um, now. He's a great campaigner. He has been very focused on the job it's giving us through the pandemic. It's different now. I'd like to... S uh, we need to get him out. Uh, out talking to, to people. Desperate to shift the focus, the Home Affairs Minister announced the imminent reopening of Australia's borders. The details, though, to be determined. We're going through the process of preparing to open. 
What's most damaging about this latest leak is that the damning critique of Scott Morrison's character has once again come from his own side. With the Prime Minister down, the Liberals' first attack ad suggests their strategy is to try and bring the Labor leader down with him. What do we actually know about Anthony Albanese? An attempt to define him before voters do. Jane Norman, ABC News, Canberra. And still to come on ABC News Sunday, we'll take a closer look at the impending federal poll. I'm Matthew Doran in the Melbourne electorate of Chisholm, one of the most marginal and multicultural anywhere in the country. After two years of pandemic living, Australians will head to the polls in a matter of months. We're taking a look at the issues which could sway voters in must-win seats like this one. The CFS has quickly brought a grass fire at Pake Town in the Adelaide Hills under control. But over in the west, a man has been injured and at least five homes have been destroyed in bushfires in WA South. The two bushfires in Denmark and Bridgetown have been burning for days at emergency level and late today a third fire in the eastern wheat belt ramped up, threatening lives and homes. Police are investigating whether one of the blazes was deliberately lit. Fires raging on multiple fronts. WA's emergency services are battling blazes across the state's southwest. Properties have been destroyed in Denmark on the south coast. Our rapid damage assessment team uh, has identified uh, four homes uh, that have been lost uh, to date uh, and one that's been damaged. They're also reporting another four structures that have been lost. The blaze doubling in size in a single night. The most southern, you know, one of the most southern parts of our state, uh, to have a fire uh, double in size overnight uh, is, is, is not, not territory we've been in often before. Further north at Bridgetown, another blaze turned into an emergency, forcing the evacuation of residents and the local hospital. All our important things are here. We've got our family here and that's the main thing and we're safe, so that was our main concern. Not everyone was so lucky. I understand uh, a local uh, resident uh, was uh, was uh, burnt uh, fighting the fire early uh, in the fire yesterday afternoon. I understand he's, he's in a, a serious condition. Properties have been lost in Bridgetown too, including two shire buildings and one house. Though it appears the weather may be easing for parts of the state, the situation uh, in the emergency warning areas continues to remain dire. While emergency services are stretched, help is on the way. A unit from New South Wales arrived this afternoon, while a third heavy water bomber is now also available to help crews on the ground. Tom Wildey, ABC News. Police are investigating a fire that destroyed a church in Adelaide South last night. The St Francis of Assisi Anglican Church at Christie's Beach was engulfed in flames when firefighters arrived just after midnight. More than 40 firefighters battled the blaze at the church, which was undergoing renovations, but it couldn't be saved. The damage bill is estimated at $2 million. The cause of the fire is not yet known. The mission to rescue a boy trapped in a well in Morocco has ended in tragedy. There was initial excitement when emergency crews finally reached five-year-old Ryan, pulling him from where he'd been stuck, 32 metres underground for four days. But then the King of Morocco issued an official statement announcing the boy had died. He's spoken to Ryan's parents. All of Morocco had been gripped by the complex mission to save the boy, which had been hampered by fears of a landslide. The first US troops reinforcing NATO allies in Eastern Europe have landed in Germany as tensions continue with Russia. The American soldiers will set up new headquarters to support 1,700 paratroopers poised to deploy to Poland. A shipment of US weapons for Ukraine has also landed in the capital, Kiev. The moves are in response to the build-up of 100,000 Russian troops along Ukraine's border. In the latest developments, Russia deployed a pair of long-range nuclear-capable bombers in aerial drills over Belarus. The Queen has expressed her wish that Camilla, the Duchess of Cornwall, be known as Queen Consort when Prince Charles becomes king. The couple has issued a statement to say they were touched and honoured. As Europe correspondent Nick Dole reports, today marks the 70th anniversary of the Queen's reign. A newly crowned Queen is cheered through the streets of London by an adoring public. Celebrations like these have been repeated for seven decades. There have been countless highs. But the past year has delivered a series of lows. 
the Queen's son, Prince Andrew, is accused of sexual assault. He denies it, but with a potentially damaging civil trial looming, she's stripped him of his royal responsibilities. When it looked as if he was become a danger to the reputation, even perhaps the long-term survival of the monarchy, there was ruthlessness. Harry and Meghan's interview with Oprah exposed major fault lines in the family. Allegations of racism painted a picture of an institution that was out of touch. Just a few weeks later, the Queen lost her husband, the Duke of Edinburgh, a man she described as her strength and stay. Royal watchers say the monarch is making room for a new generation to rise. It's quite telling that, you know, in recent photographs and portraits, we've seen the Queen with Prince Charles, Prince William and Prince George. There is the future. And she's warmed to the Duchess of Cornwall, who's gone from being an outsider to a trusted senior royal. To mark her jubilee, the monarchs declared Camilla should be not just a princess, but a queen. While this weekend officially marks the Platinum Jubilee, the palace is keeping things low-key, with a much bigger celebration promised later this year. But there is one event planned, a challenge to find a dessert that's fit for a queen. British bakers are sending in entries for a so-called platinum pudding. Gwyneth Boys and her blind baking group think the Queen will love their meringue pie. I'm sure she would. I know she likes honey, so that's why you put honey in the cream. <laughs> and the royal seal of approval would be the icing on the cake. Nick Dole, ABC News, London. Australia's economy is slowly getting back on track, but for roughly one million Australian homeowners, it's about to lead to something they've not experienced before, a rise in interest rates. Here's Alan Kohler. The last rate hike in Australia was November the 3rd, 2010, more than 11 years ago. The RBA cash rate went from 4.5 to 4.75%. The next one could be this year, from 0.1%, probably to 0.25% anytime from May onwards. And the futures market, in fact, thinks that the cash rate could be 1% by the end of the year. Here's what that would look like on a chart. Hardly terrifying, right? An absolute doddle, in fact, except for a couple of things. Here's the number of first home buyer loans that have been made since the last rate hike 11 years ago. 1,141,592. That's how many households have never experienced an increase in their interest rate. And as money became cheaper and banks became marketing machines instead of loan rationers, Australians learned to love debt. And as debt as a percentage of income pushed higher, so did house prices. Or was it the other way around? Anyway, interest rates are now gonna be normalized because last week, both the Reserve Bank Governor and the Prime Minister predicted that unemployment is going to fall below 4%. And in that situation, it's very difficult to justify abnormal interest rates. But the question is, what's normal? Because we've all forgotten. Let's have another look at that cash rate chart. Normal looks like 5%, doesn't it? And now here's the average variable mortgage rate. When the cash rate is 5%, the mortgage rate is about 7.5%. The last time that happened, 11 years ago, the average mortgage was $363,421 and repayments on that were $2,696 per month. Now the average mortgage is $602,035 and repayments on that at 7.5% interest would be $4,459 per month. $1,775 more. To make that after tax would require an extra $35,000 in annual salary. Except that in the past 11 years, the average annual wage has only gone up 13,300. So maybe the RBA won't be able to normalise interest rates after all. Alan Kohler there. And now to tonight's special report. The lingering COVID-19 pandemic and intense cost of living pressures are promising to make the looming federal election campaign even more unpredictable than usual. Political reporter Matthew Doran has visited the hotly contested corners of the country to get a sense of the issues that will sway people's votes. The anticipation for better times ahead is palpable across the country. Lunar New Year in Melbourne bringing a sense of renewal and hope, sentiments more than welcome in this pandemic-weary city. 
Despite the noise, celebrations are again muted this year. COVID-19 forcing many events to be cancelled, from the CBD to the suburbs. Previous years we've had around about 60,000 to 100,000 people show up. And, you know, um, during COVID, that's not really a, a good thing. Postponing Box Hills Festival, the obvious choice given soaring case numbers, organising it in the first place, difficult enough. I think we made 200 calls in one day asking for um, potential food vendors and 70% of them came back bankrupt, like they were gone. It's a familiar tale for many small businesses, not just in Melbourne. But this area happens to be in one of the nation's most marginal federal electorates. Just a handful of votes could decide the fate of Chisholm, currently held by the Liberals. The vibe right now is day to day, right? You, you survive it and you win, right? Stephen Zeng owns a number of restaurants in the area. One of his chefs died during the pandemic. My first concern is the health of my family, my community. The second concern would be getting back to the normal way of life. Carving out a new business model, lacking one basic ingredient. Now out of lockdown, but with case numbers so high, it's still very difficult in terms of uh, fighting staff that wants to work in this kind of environment. Stephen Zeng's not expecting more financial support from governments, but he's hungry for a coherent plan to help ensure his businesses can survive into the future. Which is easier said than done. That's why these people are the leaders, right? They, they have to come up with the solutions. Right now, there's literally nothing for these shop owners and a lot of them are going out of business. Like Stephen Zeng, Richard Shee grew up in Box Hill and says businesses which have served the area for two decades are closing their doors. It's a very, very sad time. He insists support can't solely be the responsibility of the states and territories. We live in Australia. We live in Victoria. <laughs> we, we do business in the city of Whitehall. So I think it's a team effort and there just needs to be some help for the small guys. And while the economic toll of the pandemic is providing food for thought ahead of the election, the social cost is just as high, albeit less visible. There's a huge increase of demand on our services, particularly for our family violence and elder abuse victim survivors. The debate over family violence and the treatment of women more broadly has been one of the biggest political and social debates during the last term of Parliament. While welcoming the attention, those on the front line aren't entirely convinced real solutions are in the offing. I think people are well-meaning, but um, it's... It can appear to be very knee-jerk sometimes. More funding always welcome, but better planning is key. For those of us who have had first-hand experience of family violence, either ourselves or people that we love, or those of us who work um, in the family violence sector, you know, yeah, it definitely would be a vote changer in some way, but also because it is so emotive. A world away from suburban Melbourne, Tasmania's picturesque Tamar Valley has been shielded from the worst of pandemic restrictions. But David Feldheim's vineyards have suffered in the past. Most people don't get that smoke from bushfires can ruin a whole crop. He lives in the ultra-marginal electorate of Bass, which the Liberals need to hold on to, protecting his family business so his kids can be the next generation of winemakers front of mind at the ballot box. It's just shocking. The, at the complete lack of response to the bushfire approach and to the kind of the whole ogre of climate change, which I see as a farmer on the front line. 1,600 kilometres away in Brisbane, in the marginal Labor electorate of Griffith, no more Riley's on the hunt for a new house. I've been a renter for 10 years now, um, and during the 10 years I've lived in nine different places. The home she currently rents is being sold by its owners. I assume because the market is doing so well at the moment. This property sold for 610000 in 2018 and it's now valued at 1.2 to 1.5 million. After losing her job during the pandemic, Noam went back to university. Finding an affordable place to live while juggling work and study 
proving incredibly tough. You're overhearing conversations where people are offering to pay three months in rent in advance or um, hundreds of dollars over the weekly asking price just to secure a property. Searching for accommodation and policies from the nation's leaders. I think there's probably a problem with how we're discussing housing affordability um, and the divide that's created, the us versus them, landlords versus tenants, um, millennials versus boomers, if you like. As the drumbeats of the election grow ever louder, the pandemic has brought some perennial political issues into even sharper focus. 2022 is the year of the tiger, an animal which symbolises strength, power and leadership. All traits that our political leaders will be hoping the public see in them during the campaign. But they'll have to wait until election day before they find out just how the nation has roared. Matthew Doran, ABC News, Melbourne. Students and parents around Australia have been facing the return to school this year under difficult circumstances. But for kids with disability, making the move from primary to high school comes with additional challenges. A new uniform, backpack and books are on the list for most students starting high school. But the transition has been 18 months in the making for vision impaired student Christopher McLeod Barrett. I'm feeling ex excited. I can't wait to make some new friends. And, um, and do some work. At Sunset State School in Mount Isa, the 12 year old has grown in confidence and made lots of friends. Well, he's very, very proficient in uh, movement, basically uh, attends school like anybody else and accesses the curriculum like anybody else. But becoming a little fish in a big pond is nerve wracking for anyone. Just being nervous about falling downstairs or bumping into a pole every 10 seconds. Last year, Christopher visited the junior campus of Spinifex State College twice a week, learning the lay of the land and getting to know support staff and teachers. What's probably been most challenging is that there's like 30 different levels at this school. Christopher is the first vision impaired student to attend the school. Changes have been made around the campus and braille signs have been put up to make it easier for him to move around. Christopher is a student like any other student, he's entitled to have an education that's on the same basis as his peers. It's part of our inclusive policy. But making the transition has been an expensive exercise. And Christopher is still waiting on the NDIS to approve funding for a brow machine. I did a costing at one stage and it was going to cost our school about $22,000 to get ready just to have him the federal and state government both provide funding for students with disabilities on a tiered basis. Advocates say resourcing for schools has improved since the Disability Royal Commission, but there's still more work to do. And we need needs-based funding that actually follows the student so that if they do require accommodations, they're made without questions and families are not made to feel as though they're begging for inclusion. Creating a level playing field for students like Christopher. I want to be on radio, um, like a, as a football presenter. Julia Andre, ABC News, Mount Isa. Tess Cody has won Australia's first medal at the Winter Olympics in Beijing, taking bronze in the women's snowboard slope style. At the 2018 Games, the 21-year-old tore her ACL, but she's now become the first Aussie to win an Olympic medal in the event. Here's the ABC's Winter Olympics reporter, Tracy Holmes. There she is, Tess Cody. St Kilda's Tess Cody qualified eighth for the final, but Cody endured a nerve-wracking wait while competitors were unable to push her out of third spot. She's got it. Securing the bronze medal. Yes. Let's go. <laughs> that was pretty insane. I sort of was convincing myself that I was going to come fourth, just so that when it happened it would like suck a bit less, but yeah, no stoked that it held. What? Okay, this brings tears to the eyes of... It's so sick, the camaraderie is insane, and that was such a special moment down the bottom with all the girls, yeah, it was fun. Nice. Over the last however many years, I feel a little bit embarrassed. You know, I'm so much better than that. One has actually no idea about skiing, so he's just provided me with some just great advice about, you know, um, how to prepare, consistency, you know, when to relax, when to turn on. 
Winter sports great Sean White has announced these games will be his last. The 35-year-old American has won three Olympic gold medals in halfpipe snowboarding. And Tracy Holmes joins us now from Beijing. Tracy, our curlers have just had a win against Switzerland after what's been a tumultuous day. They were nearly sent home. Can you tell us what happened? Well, it's just been an incredible journey for this team. Tali Gill and Dean Hewitt. Tali testing positive on arrival in Beijing a week ago. That was through viral shedding from a previous infection. She had a series of negatives and then two positives in the past 24 hours. She was told she could either go into an isolation unit or fly home. They elected to fly home and were preparing to do so when the expert medical panel here met and decided the positive rate was so low that she was negligibly going to infect anybody and and so they've been allowed to continue to compete. And they've got one last match against Canada this evening. And Australia has more medal hopes in tonight's events. What's coming up? Yeah, the women's moguls is where all eyes will be for Australia. Jakara Anthony's in red hot form. She qualified fastest uh, for the final. Also, Britt Cox, who's competing in her fourth Olympic Games. She's been trying for an Olympic medal since Vancouver in 2010. Maybe tonight will be her night. Tracy Holmes in Beijing. A blistering last quarter has helped Adelaide keep its perfect start to the AFLW season intact. The last undefeated team and atop the ladder. Four final quarter goals helped the Crows to a commanding 39-point victory, with the Blues left with a solitary major. A Crows side flying high on an undefeated run against a Carlton side whose season still hadn't got going. Adelaide's players were putting their body on the line and it paid off, and Hatchard bagging the first goal of the day. The Blues regularly had the ball in their forward line but couldn't get past a stingy Adelaide defence. A one-goal lead at quarter time. It was a similar story in the second, only inaccuracy keeping the Crows in check. Caitlin Gould finally kicked truly. One and it's got the carry. Adelaide finally with the major they were coveting. While the Blues had just three points to half time to trail by 16 points. The home side came out firing in the third with Georgia G on song. And G puts the Blues on the board. It was an even contest, but the Crows weathered the Blues, increasing the lead to 18 points. A steadier for the Crows through Considine. Any glimmer of hope for Carlton was rubbed out early in the last term. Ponta regathers and the Crows make the Blues pay. There was one final moment of class to come. Punches the handball for Eloise Jones, who is spectacular. Adelaide continuing on its merry way at the top. The Blues' long season getting longer. Matthew Smith, ABC News. With the women's ashes already in the bag, Australia is continuing its dominance in the series. Today, thumping England by five wickets in the second one day are in Melbourne. The focus now turns to completing a clean, a clean sweep, I should say, of the one-day matches in Tuesday's final game of the series. Australian captain Meg Lanning sent England in after winning the toss and initially it looked a bold move. But Australia had both England openers inside 11 overs and then claimed Nat Siver to start yet another collapse. Cries have catch it and safely taken. Five for 11 across nine overs England lost. Lanning with a late nomination for the catch of the summer. It's not past Meg Lanning, it's gone into a hand. Sophie Eccleston's unbeaten 32 added some respectability, but 129 all out felt well short of par. Edged and gone. In reply, Rachel Haynes looked strong until she offered an edge. Oh, edged and taken by Jones. Before the skipper fell, the same way and to the same bowler as in the last match. And balls her again. And so, having already destroyed England with the ball, taking three wickets each, Talia McGrath and Elise Perry set about finishing them off with the bat. What's this back down the ground? But McGrath played a round one from Kate Cross and Perry was caught short, leaving Ash Gardner to complete the task. Up and over the top from Ash Gardner. England left with a familiar tail. The loss of regular wickets in their batting innings, again, their downfall. Just find a way to get some partnerships together, really, because that's what we're lacking. We've had a few starts, a few little partnerships, but haven't really been able to get that big game-defining partnership. So it was nice to be able to sort of, you know, finish them off, I guess, take those 10 wickets. And um, we would have probably liked to finish it off a little bit better with the bat, but um, nice to get the win nonetheless. The Women's Ashes wraps up in Melbourne on Tuesday before both sides head to New Zealand to commence quarantine ahead of next month's World Cup. Brett McKay, ABC News. 
As Cricket Australia deals with the fallout from the shock resignation of former coach Justin Langer, questions are being asked about the internal workings of the organisation. Langer is quarantining in Perth after he sensationally quit the job via social media on Saturday morning following months of speculation over his future. Veteran cricket correspondent Gideon Haig says the whole incident leaves a sour taste. With that sense that you often get in Australian cricket of that you're not being told everything that, uh, that, that matters and also a sense of just how little people seem to matter at, at Jollymont. You know, if they treat a great servant of the game like this, just imagine what they get away with in private. Langer released his resignation letter late on Sunday to the Australian newspaper saying he's happy with his decision to reject the short-term deal offered to him. He says he hopes the team has made supporters proud in the four years he was in charge. American champion surfer Kelly Slater has made history by winning the Pipeline event in Hawaii for the eighth time in his career. The 11-time world champion's win comes 30 years after his first victory at Pipeline in 1992. Slater defeated local Seth Monies in the final at the famous surf break earlier today, just days before his 50th birthday. All the heartbreak and all the winning and all this crap, it's, it's uh, you know, I've hated lots of it, but I just savor this and this is the best one of my life. Slater needed a 7.18 to win his heat with five seconds left and pulled off a score of 9.23. Hundreds of blonde bombshells have taken a dip at an Adelaide beach to collect funds for the Cancer Council. The leading ladies and more than a few lads have been dressing as Marilyn Monroe for almost a decade, raising hundreds of thousands of dollars for research. Some like it hot, but a mild Adelaide morning had to do. A record 314 Marilyn Monroe lookalikes descended upon Brighton Beach, all for a good cause. Every year this day uh, means a lot to me because I lost my mother to cancer. I've lost two sisters to cancer. We have family members that have suffered and uh, we thought good way to raise money and be a part of it. Gentlemen may prefer blondes, Others prefer to be blondes. My wife had breast cancer a few years ago. Luckily, she's OK now. In the event's ninth year, many of the bathing beauties are seasoned swimmers. Others, the misfits. Oh, I expect to be picked up by a really nice lifesaver, girl or boy, and brought in at the end. Yeah, it's my first one, and it's just such a beautiful day for it. It's fantastic. These Marilyns have already raised $120,000 today. They're hoping to double that, every cent going towards cancer research. And that means that next year, when we move into year 10, we've got a real good chance of cracking that million dollars. It means a lot because it just means we're a step closer to better treatments and care for cancer. A was worth dressing up for. Sarah Tomevska, ABC News, Adelaide. A great cause. On to all the weather details now. But first, thanks to Brian Cartwright for tonight's photo taken at a vineyard in Langhorne Creek. It was a mostly fine day across Adelaide today. We reached a top of 32.2 at about 20 past four this afternoon after the overnight low of 21.7. A strong high brought light winds and dry conditions throughout the state today. The tops ranged from 25 degrees at Cape Willoughby to 36 at Sejuna. To the charts, and a trough is producing showers and storms over the northern tropics, while a cold front is generating showers over southwest WA. Tomorrow, that front could bring showers over western parts of our state. A low with onshore winds will also trigger showers along the east coast. So there'll be showers in Sydney with 25 degrees, sunny and 23 for Hobart, storms and 31 in Darwin. Back home, showers and possible storms in the far northeast of the state and west of about Nullarbor in the evening with gusty winds. 32 degrees in Lee Creek, up to 37 in Port Pirie. Further south, it should stay hot and dry throughout with tops of 34 degrees over the southeast and 31 for Clare. A strong wind warning will remain in place for the far west coast for tomorrow. Partly cloudy in the city tomorrow, up to 33 degrees after tonight's warm low of 22. On the waters, easterly winds up to 15 knots, then turning northeasterly during the morning, seas below a metre. Sunrise at 20 to 7 with sunset about 20 past 8. 
Looking ahead, hot again on Tuesday with 34 degrees, before a cool change on Wednesday with 25, then staying mostly fine with the temperature warming up to 36 by this time next week. And that's the news to now. Thanks for your company. From all of us here in the Adelaide Newsroom, have a great night.